The U.S. is in relative decline as the Chinese power is rapidly rising. There is a huge trade deficit with China, and billions of dollars every year are flowing out of our country to them. $419.2 billion was the trade deficit in 2018 with China. This loss of wealth is not good for the USA. China's economy gathered momentum in October, supported by gains in factory production, government backed investment, and consumer spending, according to official data on Monday. Industrial output rose 6.9% in October from a year earlier, on par with September's pace, China's official National Bureau of Statistics said. The result was better than the 6.5% increase forecast in the Wall Street Journal's poll of economists. The news that on Sunday China signed a massive free trade deal with 15 Asia Pacific nations confirms China is busy cutting a path forward even as much of the world is in economic turmoil due to the pandemic. This is a major victory in that it encompasses almost one third of all global economic activity. It also gives the impression the United States is being left out in the cold. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, establishes the world's largest trading bloc. It was signed virtually during the annual summit of the Ten Nation Association of Southeast Asian Nations. ASEAN. This underlines the fact that despite economic problems popping up in countries across the world, China is hellbent on pursuing its goal of galvanizing itself as the leading global power. Not waiting to resolve trade issues with America, China is busy turning economic lemons into lemonade. One example of China reaching out can be seen in its courting of Europe. Last year, the European Union and China, after a series of meetings, came up with an important joint statement. It outlined agreement on three quite sensitive fronts and paved the way for a complex, wide ranging EU China investment deal. To put this in context, this came at a time when the German government had just cut its GDP forecast and the Eurozone economy was slowing. The statement was signed by Chinese Premier Li Keqiang. European Commission President Jean Claude Juncker, and head of the European Council, Donald Tusk. This has been described as the real deal and is viewed as a departure from antics such as the endless Brexit saga. The agreement was free of any accusations of unfair trade hurled at Beijing. It appears that Brussels and Beijing seem to be finally engaging in building some sort of synergy between the One Belt, One Road, OBOR initiative. This is outlined in the EU Connecting Europe and Asia Project Report. China is pushing forward and financing OBOR with its economy having a huge debt GDP ratio already well above 300%, according to the Institute of International Finance. The president of the World Bank, David Malpass, has claimed there is too much debt floating around the world, and China is a big reason why. While his view could be written off as totally political, this is not the first indication that China has gone, shall we say, over the top in creating new credit. Last year, the IMF has warned China of the risk having to do with increasing China's debt by agreeing to loans which could prove economically explosive. More and more of the debt over the last year has been related to and intricately interwoven into China's far reaching and encompassing OBOR initiative. Malpass said, There are challenges facing the world in terms of how do you have transparent projects that are high quality, where the debt is transparent. China moved so fast that in some part of the world there is just too much debt. While at the IMF, Christine Lagarde, the current head of the ECB, raised these concerns and has made it clear that Beijing was fully aware of the potential potholes associated with such a massive undertaking as OBOR and underwriting its funding. The cost of the planned network to connect China with 68 countries and 4.4 billion people across Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and Europe in a labyrinth of multi trillion dollar transportation, energy, and telecommunications infrastructure projects may total as much as 8 trillion US dollars. Videos have appeared on this channel over the years arguing that China is not our friend and its economy is predatory by nature. One such video explored how China was ramping up its fledgling aviation industry and how, when it hits its stride, we can expect cutthroat competition. The video warns that COMAC Commercial Aircraft Corp. of China claims its new twin engine, narrow body design of the C919 is superior to the Boeing 737, the best selling jetliner in the world. COMAC also says it can bring the C919 in at a price lower than the $50 million range that Boeing and Airbus charge for each of their planes. If history is any indication, this industry will not grow organically but to be driven forward by an aggressive government with a mission.
When China's aviation industry takes flight over the next few years, America and Europe should expect to say goodbye to a huge chunk of exports in this field. Another issue addressed in past blogs is the merger of China's two largest companies involved in the production of railway locomotives, bullet trains, passenger trains, and metro vehicles. It pointed out that no effort was made to deny the impetus for the merger of China CNR Corp and CSR Corp in 2015 was the quest for a deeper push into overseas markets. Since the merger, China has been able to win by a wide margin nine figure contracts, such as the supply of metro cars to Boston and LA. It should also be noted that CRRC formed a consortium with Bombardier, which allowed it to compete for the renewal of the New York subways, a huge contract that should amount to around $1.5 billion. Another video focused on America's trade deficit with Mexico. When following the money, it becomes clear that money from the United States' huge trade deficit with Mexico eventually ends up in China. When you start thinking about all the money and jobs we shift into Mexico each year, you would think by now Mexico would be rolling in cash. However, a bit of research quickly confirms that the money Mexico receives by way of trading with America quickly passes through its lands and flows to Asia. It could be argued that when all is said and done, we are still transferring our wealth to the Far East only by the scenic route, and each year the numbers are huge. North Americans have been sending over half a trillion dollars a year to Asia each year. Emboldened by this influx of wealth, China has played fast and loose with creating and loaning out new funds. As debt service rises, this can create serious balance of payment challenges. Obor to move forward has to provide the financing for infrastructure that many countries desperately want and need, but will they be able to repay the loans in coming years? The Center for Global Development, a Washington based think tank, Has highlighted in a report entitled Examining the Debt Implications of the Belt and Road Initiative from a Policy Perspective, the underlined the problems of extending credit to poor or unstable countries. It has pointed out that as many as 23 countries could be prone to debt distress. This group includes Pakistan, Djibouti, the Maldives, Laos, Mongolia, Montenegro, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan, which were rated in the high risk category. This brings us to the question of whether Obor will become a massive expensive bridge to nowhere. While China has lent trillions of dollars to countries, the motivation behind these loans must be questioned. Circling back to Malpass, it should be noted he has also criticized China for taking low cost loans from the World Bank despite being the second largest economy in the world. China even surpassed the bank's income threshold for low cost loans in 2016. Malpass has also been critical of China's lending in conjunction with funding its Obor Infrastructure Initiative, claiming these loans can saddle weaker countries with excessive debt and low quality projects. The bottom line is China is our rival. China's state run economy is based on a business model that is geared to expand by crushing the competition. China has no intention of being locked into producing low end manufacturing of basic goods but is determined to move into high tech products. China's plan centers around both state owned and private firms investing in and acquiring foreign companies to steal their technological innovations. Subsidizing those companies working within its system in a multitude of ways helps China achieve this goal. Countries that export goods at slightly below cost in exchange for manufacturing jobs are not stupid, they are predatory, and America and the rest of the world are their prey. In conclusion, the Chinese are smart, have a very strong work ethic, and a high pain threshold. China is not a nation of rugged individualists. No, their society is more like a bee or ant hive. They have a can do attitude. They have been hungry for a long time. They have a business DNA. They have a homogeneous racial and social makeup. They were a sophisticated society when Europeans were tribal. They seem okay with a communist form of government. They work smart and cheap, and there are well over a billion of them. They have a huge country loaded with raw materials. They have enormous amounts of money since the West surrendered all of its manufacturing and related technologies to the Chinese in order to reap short term gains. The Chinese think long term. And the Chinese have a very proud nationalistic spirit. Look how the Vietnam War turned out, against all odds. This was the Nomad Economist. Please like, share, leave me a comment, subscribe. And please take some time to subscribe to my backup channels, I do upload videos there too. You'll find the links in the description box. You will also find a PayPal link if you want to make a donation.
Thank you wholeheartedly to all those of you who have donated. Stay safe and healthy friends.